bird flying high, you know how I feel. Sun in the sky, you know how I feel. Breeze drifting on by, you know how I feel. It's a new dawn, it's a new day, it's a new life for me. And I'm feeling good. Thank you. Note to self, remember to breathe. <laughs> they say that we know what we want to be in our life, our passion, our dreams, from when we're five years old. Mine was to be a singer. I was maybe five years old when I began pursuing my career in music. <laughs> and I was determined. I was going to record some songs, I was going to get on TV, become famous, and then buy an island. <laughs> I still want that island, by the way. <laughs> Me and that island. <laughs> I, used to, I grew up in a society, I mean, I'm Lebanese. I don't know if uh, you're familiar with Lebanese culture. This is our national attire. <laughs> Just kidding, it's not, it's not. <laughs> And this is, the Lebanese culture is basically a bunch of people who love life and enjoy every minute. They love to dress up where they go, and they place a lot of emphasis on the external appearance. You could go to the supermarket, and they are, you know, all gala mode. <laughs> and here comes little me, you know, chubby Ruba, you know, trying to make her way through life. And then people just had me pegged out, I didn't even say a word. And they just knew exactly who I was. And they talked about it, you know, like the physical period. And I didn't understand, what, why are you telling my mother that she should like put me on a diet or something? Why is this so important to you? I didn't realize how important it was for society. What it did was, was at an early age, I started, it started making me feel like I was always not good enough, not smart enough, uh, I wasn't pretty enough, I wasn't dressed well enough. So from that very early stage, I had to like, figure out a lot of life stuff, you know, for a six, seven, eight-year-old, that's a lot of <laughs> material to take in. But I, I never let it discourage me. What I did was, is I found solace in music. Like, I'd go tuck myself away in a little corner and sing. And when they teach you to sing, they tell you always open, keep your eyes open and engage the crowd. You know, don't close your eyes. A lot of singers do that. It's my favorite part. <laughs> I love closing my eyes and going into the music. And that's what I used to do. And when I sang, I was weightless, shapeless, Nobody could tell me whether I was good or not. I was perfect in that space. And I sang and I sang until the age of 16. I thought, you know, that's it. This is my career. I'm going to become a singer. And that's, everyone asked me. I was just, you know, waiting for that island, right? <laughs> but I let the noise of society's expectation of what I was supposed to do, I let it in. And my doubt of myself and my talent and my abilities was put into question. So I did what everyone, you know, the right thing to do. I went to college and I studied advertising and communication and I sought out a career in there because ultimately I wasn't a good enough singer, right? I mean, there was always that fear. Oh, see, that's me, by the way, when I was <laughs> singing at a very young age. And so I let that fear come in and I let it make a dictation on my life to leave music. I went and I studied advertising, that became my career. I went up the ladder, you know, the usual, the weekends, the nights, the late nights, all of that. I still do it, by the way. And I let music take the back seat. This is, it's called the imposter syndrome, by the way. A lot of very high achievers, they can't internalize that feeling of success or the, the successes that they've had. And so they feel that they're, gonna, they're a fraud and they're about to be pegged out. So it was a relief to know that this is a state of mind that a lot of people share. It's Dr. Pauline Clance and Suzanne who actually coined that term, the imposter syndrome. So I did what everyone does. I got married. <laughs> I thought, you know, this is it. I'll get married, I'll have kids, and then my life will be just perfect. Because I'd watched Cinderella so many times. <laughs> and believe me, she walked down that aisle and she lived happily ever after. There was no sequel to that movie. Little did I know that life came in and I became a private detector to find out when the affairs were happening. And it became my life. I became, but I could smell lies from a mile away now, you know. <laughs> and here I was, you know, thinking, you know, I'd done it. I opened my own company. I was married and I was about to have our first baby. And the affairs, obviously, still happening. And the marriage broke. He fell in love with someone else. 
younger, prettier, thinner. You can just put all those labels in there. And I found myself a single mother. No, sorry. A single mother of a boy by myself, back in Lebanon, in that society that is Arab and wants you to get married and never get divorced no matter what happens. So not only was I divorced, I was divorced with a child. Whew, big one. <laughs> not marriage material, you can imagine. And it brought in a lot of self-doubt. The thing is, people are judgmental not because they intend to be horrible people. It starts from as, as, as early as the age of three. You know, you look at people, you see them in a different light, you can't identify with them, therefore, you choose a distance. So they don't do it on purpose. But that's why I felt compelled as a mother that whenever I had a single opportunity to insert one positive message about my children's perspective on other people or life, that I would do so. I, we have, uh, every summer we go to Lebanon and we spend the summers there. If you've been to Brumana, this is our city, our hometown. And there's this little ice cream shop there. The owner of the ice cream shop has a daughter called Yasmina. Yasmina is a little person with a huge personality. I remember I took Naya, my daughter, for the first time. She was just about three at the time. And I, and I saw her when she saw Yasmina. You could tell she was starting to get ideas in her head. You know, this she looks like an older person, but she's small. And what's going on here? And the image was starting to form. So I went up to Naya and I said, Oh my God, doesn't she look so interesting, mommy? Look at her big smile. Come, let's go get to know her and talk to her. And we went and we spoke to Yasmina, and Yasmina had gone to Brumana High School, so she spoke perfect English and the Arabic barrier, because my kids barely speak any Arabic. And they hit it off. And now my daughter, whenever she wants to go to the ice cream shop, she wants to go and see Yasmina. She's not going to the ice cream store. So that was one opportunity that I had, and I'm continuously planting these kinds of seeds, where I tell my kids, look beyond the first impression. Maybe that first impression that you got from that person was on a day. They were having a bad day. They didn't feel like talking. They're not introverts. It just so happened that day. People are in the layers. They're not in that little synopsis that you've given yourself from because you know, you've seen people, you can peg them out. I learned that there was a kryptonite to people's uh, judgment of us, and it's called confidence. If you ever walk into a room and you have the slightest self-doubt, people smell it on you like dogs smell fear. Nelson Mandela once said that courage is not the absence of fear, but rather the triumph over it. I feel like confidence is not the absence of insecurities. We all have them. I'm sure we all have our list. But it's coexisting with them. It's understanding why they're there, forgiving yourself for having them, being self-acceptant. So I created Ruba. Ruba was born again. <laughs> Ruba, the girl who hated her curls growing up. Now I celebrate my curls. This is my, my symbol or my logo, if you like. So I celebrated my curls. The little lines are my scars. I went back throughout my life and I made peace with all the different phases of my life. Every single scar that I had, I wore like a badge of honor. You know, I did well. And I, finally, I was owning up to it. And my motto is truth, strength, and love, because I want to approach everything with truth and genuine state of mind. I want to be strong, no matter how tough it gets. And love, as much, an abundance of love right here, to give and to take. As a mother of two kids, now remarried, because I found love again, you know, they say love like you've never been hurt before, it works, but find someone who will push and support you. So I found myself in that strong, family support system, and I thought, okay, I'm bordering on 40. I've always wanted to be a singer. I've abandoned it for so long, but I want to be a singer again. You know, yes, okay, I did a career. I did it really well. I still do it. Can't I do both? Can't I be a singer and an executive during the day? Yes, I can. And so I decided I'm going to work on my <laughs> first album. And I called it Mama's Back, because I'm a mama and I'm back. <laughs> I came back to music with so much enthusiasm. You'd think I was like 16, you know, like I'm doing my first album and all of the, the perks that come with it. It's amazing how when, when you decide that you're going to go in a certain direction, the universe just comes to your rescue because they know she's, she's going for it. We'd better help her. So I met a producer based in Los Angeles. I met musicians based all over the world that worked on this record. 
there was the, one of the voices, the backing vocalist on this album is the same person who goes on tour with Mary J. Blige. Like, I adore Mary J. Blige and her backing vocalist is on this. It just goes to show that there's an alignment that we have no idea exists, but it comes in full force when we say, I am going for this. I got the opportunity to perform at this huge concert where you had the usual lineup, you know, CeeLo Green, Missy Elliott, Ruba, <laughs> just like part of the name. <laughs> Hello! <laughs> As I was about to get on the stage, we're talking 60,000 people, like it's like a carpet of, of people. And I was about to get on stage, my knees were shaking like crazy. I was going to faint. I saw stars that day. And I, was, I remember standing there singing, it's about time I got on that stage and I reclaimed my place. I'm a singer and this is my voice. Take it or leave it. It was a wonderful day, by the way. I will never forget the experience of like tasting the fruit of the pursuit of your passion. It tastes beautiful. And it's not about the money, it's not about the records, the billboard charts, it has nothing to do with that. It's just the fact that I was true to myself and my inner calling and I went for it all the way. I called my quest Finding My Venus. It, I even created a blog called Finding My Venus. For me, Venus is that perfect alignment with yourself. When you believe in yourself enough, you've forgiven yourself, you love yourself, you appreciate yourself exactly the way you are. And that for me is that ultimate thing. And we have multiple talents. I'm not just a singer, I'm not just a writer, I'm not just uh, a communications expert. I, I might decide to become an astronaut tomorrow. Seriously, I might do that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you're entitled to that multiple diversity of self. Don't, I, I don't like to feel like I'm in one box. I'm in this box at the moment. <laughs> We don't know what's going to happen later. I felt also this major desire to use my voice, you know, to shed light on the things that matter. And I feel like this is, this is my motto. Having your voice heard presents you with an opportunity to place the things that matter in the limelight so that more people can be made aware of it. I have so many passions. I love supporting autism. And by the way, in autism music, therapy apparently gives them so much vocabulary to kids who would otherwise speak a few words. But yet when they sing, their vocab expands. Another favorite subject to me is empowering other women, sisters and mothers. And I feel like with the journey that I went through, we have a lot of things in common. And I love to use my voice for, you know, getting my sisters out there, being stronger, doing what they want to do. There's this lady called Louise Hay. She wrote a book in her 80s. It's called Empowering Women. I loved that book so much that I got like a bunch of copies, kept them with me in the car, ready to give another powerful mama a book. And she talked about the unity between women. She said that women are always intimidated by each other. They compare each other to one another, whereas each one is different in her own way. Your scars, your experience, your life makes you unique just the way you are. You don't have to have the same features to you know, feel at par. We don't have to be at par. And I feel this is probably one of the biggest challenges that we have to unite as women. Then you will see what power means. I, I always, <laughs> we are all super women, we are all wonder women. I always find myself having a conversation with someone who doesn't like their hair or their, their hair is too blonde or too brunette or too uh, curly or too flat. Or, God makes no mistakes. If he gave you that nose, he knows that it fits your face. Why are you, there's not an amount of plastic surgery in the world that we can do to make us feel better about ourselves. It's a decision when we choose. The thing is, the inspiration is out there. Like growing up, I remember I used to look around and see where am I going to find this kind of inspiration. I found it at home. I have a mother who's a career woman. She's an artist and she's a curator and she's a pioneer in her own right. And she was always like this mother of three battling in the world and she, there's not a thing she wanted to do that she didn't go for. Traveling the world, showing her art. It started there, Nina Simone. Nina Simone, when she was eight years old, she was a, a musical prodigy and she was about to give a concert and they wouldn't let her parents sit in the front row because this was still in the segregation era. She refused to get on stage. This is an eight-year-old girl. The inspiration I got from that story alone is incredible, to have that kind of bravery to stand up. Oprah, we and Coco Chanel, by the way, I love Coco Chanel. And Oprah, who told us you can be a multi-billionaire, you can be this pioneer, you can educate hundreds of women every year. Yes, you draw inspiration from that too. Um Kulthum, 
Um Kulthum is a, an Arab woman who grew up in an era that was so oppressive to women, yet her voice was beyond the beautiful music that she made. She was very opinionated, outspoken, and nobody could uh, shoot her down. Ella Fitzgerald, also in an era, in her music, and she broke barriers in music, even with, with the compositions that she used to make. She created scatting. Jill Scott, one of my favorite artists, before she got on stage one day, uh, they were doing a documentary on her, and um, the reporter asked her, he said, you're about to get on stage uh, right after Erika Badu, don't you feel a bit nervous? And she's like, honey, have you heard my voice? <laughs> <laughs> she, she believes in this thing called the queendom, and in the, in the queendom, we are all beautiful, we can all do and achieve and grow, and you know, there's room for all of us. My favorite, Maya Angelou. Maya Angelou was so sassy, by the way. The way she used to write is beautiful. There's uh, this little poem that she wrote. Uh, she says in it, Pretty women wonder where my secret lies. I'm not built like a fashion model's size. And when I start to tell them, they think I'm telling lies. I say, <laughs> it's in the reach of my arms, in the width of my hips. It's in the stride of my step, in the curl of my lips. I am, I am a woman phenomenally, phenomenal woman, that is me. <laughs> we are all phenomenal. Part of embracing the past and the history of myself, one of them was the fact that whenever I sang, I cried. I'm a very emotional person. Put a cartoon up and there's an emotional moment, Pass the tissues, please. And I'm, I don't care, I, like, I'm, I express it, I don't mind. But growing up, you're made to think that being emotional, or hypersensitive, as I like to call it, uh, is, is, is not a good thing. But yet, in <laughs> retrospect, I found that it was this kind of emotion that enabled me to connect with the audience that I sang to. I was about 18 years old, and um, I was performing a song that I wrote for my mother. And it was a profound song, you know, where I confessed that I made my mother's life horrible for the past teenage, four teenage years that I'd passed with. But it was, and this woman in the audience started to cry. And I looked at her and I just couldn't understand how my voice had reached her and she got emotional about it and she cried. I was still 18, so I wasn't aware of, you know, the impact that you could have. But that for me was that confirmation in retrospect of one of the things that I perceived to be my biggest weakness was actually my biggest strength as an artist. That is what helped me connect to people whenever I spoke to them. And so once I found this freedom to express my voice again and go for it, and I'm gonna make other albums, I'm still writing music now, and whatever comes, bring it. I'm just ready for it. And finding that voice meant that I'm not quiet anymore. Like if there's something that happens in my life that I'm, or, or, or a matter that is placed in, in my mindset and that I have to comment on it, I'm not happy with it, I will say it. It gets me into trouble, granted. Yeah, <laughs> but I speak because I have that freedom. We have that freedom to speak. It's about time that women, as women, we stood up and really took ownership of that freedom that we have. I mean, if we look back just a few decades ago, they didn't have a third of the voice that we have. They couldn't vote, they couldn't speak, they couldn't go out, they couldn't drive, nothing. Look at us. We've come a long way. And once you taste that freedom, khalas. In Arabic, they say khalas means, you know, you can't. And I'd like to end this with the words of Nina Simone, who said, Whoa, freedom is mine. And I know just how I feel. It's a new dawn, it's a new day. It's a new life for me. And I'm feeling good. Thank you.